Thank you for joining us for the series, New Thinking on Investment Treaties. For this presentation, we have Kevin Gallagher, who will be speaking on financial flows, capital controls, and investment treaties. I'm the co-director of the Global Economic Governance Initiative at Boston University, and I've worked for a long time on the intersection between trade and a whole bunch of other issues. Today, I'm going to talk about the intersection between trade and investment treaties and how they interact with uh, financial stability and regulations to prevent and mitigate financial crises. I'm going to be bold, calling it Mission Creep, Trade Treaties and Financial Stability in Emerging Markets. I'm going to make four points in case I put you to sleep. The first is that there's new economic thinking about the need to and efficacy of regulating cross-border financial flows. And when I say cross-border financial flows, I mean short-term bonds, stocks, derivatives that move across international borders and national borders most particularly. Second, the ability to apply cross-border financial regulations is often, often incompatible with commitments on trade and investment treaties. Third, there's a real need to reform the trade regime and make it more compatible with regulating finance. We learned the hard way that without the proper regulations in place, the whole world can be very susceptible to financial crises and instability. Fourth, to end on a good, uh, good news note, uh, there's some significant movement in this direction in the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations, which will be the biggest North-South regional trade agreement that we have in history. So first, let's start with the new economics of capital flows. Let me start with a picture. This is a picture of capital flows to emerging markets from industrialized countries to emerging market developing countries such as Brazil, South Korea, South Africa, Paraguay, Chile, uh, et cetera, Myanmar, Malaysia. And it goes back to the early 1980s. And hopefully you can see something quite stark. It's not very stable. It's characterized by what we refer to as surges or big upticks in capital flows, and then sudden stops where all of a sudden capital flows don't happen anymore. And then uh, there's usually a big retreat. And you can see that every single time there's been a big surge in capital flows to emerging markets and developing countries, there's also been a pretty significant financial crisis at some point in the cycle. These surges, when there's a surge, there occurs what are called financial amplification effects. Remember that most emerging market and developing countries don't have the dollar. Most countries in the world don't have the dollar as their primary exchange rate. So a fundamental aspect of an economic transaction that has to occur is the exchange of dollars for the domestic currency. So during those peaks in that last in that last graph, uh, which we call surges, that also causes an appreciation of the exchange rate. What do I mean by an appreciation of the exchange rate? Well, if something goes in more demand, then the price is going to be higher. Same thing for market determined exchange rates. If one is demanding more of it, the cost of it will go up. And so the value of it will go up. That makes the cost of many of your goods and services more expensive, but we'll hold on to that thought for a second. So when the exchange rates go up, you think that you have countries, corporations, uh, and other actors in the financial markets think that they have more collateral, right? Hey, I can borrow more money because my exchange rate is valued so much, I have that as collateral to pay back. So that often is accompanied by an expansion of domestic credit in a country. Corporations borrow more money thinking that they can expand on uh, into other markets and governments often uh, also borrow more during a surge. And that pushes out aggregate demand, causes economic growth. That's the good news. But when there's a sudden stop, the reverse happens. And that's when you're in a lot of trouble. So if for some reason there's a sudden stop, which are usually signaled by interest rate changes in the industrialized countries, especially the United States federal funds rate, um, and or growth slowdowns or projected growth slowdowns in emerging market and developing countries, you get a sudden stop. And when there's a sudden stop and then capital flight, of course, no one wants your currency or less people want your currency, so the price, is it, price of it declines. That might be good for your exports, but since all those 
debts by the corporate sector and by governments were denominated in dollars, that has significant balance sheet effects for both countries and governments, uh, countries, governments, and corporations, because now if the price of a currency depreciates by, depreciates by 50%, that means you have to come up with that much more uh, pesos or ringgits to be able to pay those international debts out. And as your uh, as this amplification happens, you get falling demand and contributes to slow growth in the economy. Let's review these two things real quick. Surges of inflows are associated with buildups of foreign debt and the appreciation of a currency, a rise in the domestic asset prices, and thus an increase in the internationally acceptable collateral on the basis of which domestic agents can borrow abroad. Sudden stops lead to capital outflows, which cause depreciation in the exchange rate and decline in asset prices. This is amplified by an inability to repay foreign creditors in domestic currencies, and given that the value of domestic assets has depressed, you have severe currency mismatch issues, and it can really trigger financial instability. This is a picture uh, before and after the financial crisis in the euro zone that just shows how these amplification effects really occur. We have a massive surge in emerging market capital flows uh, right up until the crisis of 2007, which is also accompanied by a major surge in exchange rates. That's what RER is, the real effective exchange rate. And then simultaneous with the, uh, with the crisis in 2008 and the Eurozone crisis is what you see out there on the right. The International Monetary Fund, many economists and so forth, realize that individual rational agents don't internalize their contribution to the systemic risk that happens during these surges and sudden stops, right? Think about it. When an individual participant, a hedge fund or a uh, international investor, they don't think about the joint impact of their $1 that's going into a particular country, say Brazil, on the degree of financial uh, fragility in the country. It's the same way we think about externalities in, in, in the environment, um, that one coal plant doesn't realize that every single uh, ounce of coal that's made has an, a certain amount of emissions and that cumulatively they can cause significant health risks and environmental risks to a, to a country uh, or a region. This is called an externality when the two basic agents, the supplier and the demander of a economic transaction have adverse or positive effects on a third party, but doesn't take those into account. When those third party impacts are negative, they are costs in terms of environment. Those costs have to do with health costs and uh, economic damages due to crop damages and so forth. And in, the t and in case of uh, short-term financial flows, the externalities are the financial amplification effects or financial instability. Well, what economists are arguing now is that if you internalize the negative costs of financial instability in short-term capital flows across borders, then you will correct for a market failure and make markets work better. These are what are referred to as prudential capital flows. Uh, excuse me, prudential capital controls or prudential regulations on cross-border financial flows. And the best place to put them is on the inflow of capital to prevent or at least create speed bumps for surges. Um, and here is a picture of where most economists are saying that it's most optimal to put in uh, some of the different measures. The best and most prudent to put in prudential regulations on the inflow of capital during a surge that will reduce the financial amplification effects during outflows. Countries that have did that during the surge that went basically with from 2006 to 2008 and then again from 2009 to 2013 are Brazil, Colombia, South Africa, Indonesia, a number of countries. Uh, those countries that didn't put in place strong enough regulations or that didn't put in regulations at all and didn't manage these capital flows uh, were susceptible to more of a sudden stop in capital flight when A, the industrialized country financial crisis occurred and B, during the Eurozone crisis. Some countries such as Iceland and Greece 
had to restructure their debt and put regulations on the outflow of capital to try to stem some of those impacts that happen with sudden stops. This is a very detailed um, table, but it just reiterates what I just said and gives you a flavor of some different countries and the kinds of measures that they put in place. Some countries like China and India have what I call first generation regulations that are just strict limits on the amount of capital that can go into a country. Others have more price-based approaches such as Brazil and Peru that put taxes on certain kinds of investments coming into the country. And there's been a third generation of regulations that have come since the financial crisis which are regulations on foreign exchange derivative markets because that's one of the key channels now where foreign capital flows surge into developing countries and then exit quite rapidly. The International Monetary Fund uh, sort of went through a rethinking on all these issues after the financial crisis and went through a uh, process from 2010 to 2013 to examine the extent to which uh, these regulations should, should be put in place. And they came up with a set of criteria from which they should be put in place. And they sort of rebranded them called capital flow management measures. And in numerous communiques during the surges in 2010 to 2013, and more recently during much of the sudden stops, the IMF has said things like this. When dealing with macroeconomic and financial stability risks arising from large and volatile capital flows, Macroeconomic policy adjustment could be supported by prudential measures and as appropriate capital flow management measures. This is uh, just a quick table of an analysis that I did with some colleagues on the extent to which not only did the IMF recommend that countries use, use these measures uh, in press releases at big annual meetings, but in their Article 4 reports when they go in and consult with countries. And you can see here that the red points where the IMF was either supportive or partially supportive of a country's measures uh, over the past few years has, uh, has seriously been on the rise. And in fact, in the Iceland agreement with the International Monetary Fund after they came to the rescue of Iceland in, during the crisis, the International Monetary Fund required that there be capital controls on outflows. Well, what does all this financial economics have to do with trade treaties? Well, on the one hand, We've got the re-emphasis of the need to regulate short-term capital flows and the, to prevent and mitigate financial instability in the world economy as part of a whole new thinking that has gone on since the crisis. However, the concept of openness and not having regulations on cross-border activities is so fundamental to the trade regime. And when you weren't looking, a number of uh, these issues have spilled over into non-trade issues such as foreign investment. So in fact, the GATS under the World Trade Organization really covers financial services and therefore cross-border financial regulations between countries and the rapid prolifer proliferation of bilateral investment treaties and trade treaties with large investment components uh, also uh, run into problems if you're looking to regulate cross-border financial flows. The International Monetary Fund in this reassessment that it did pointed some of this out. I have some quotes here. I'll just read, read the, the red part. It says, these agreements in many cases do not provide the appropriate safeguards for proper sequencing of liberalization. It also says members drafting such agreements in the future, as well as the various international bodies that promote these agreements could take into account the IMF's new perspective in designing circumstances under which both the inflows and outflows uh, may be regulated within the scope of their agreements. Unfortunately, many agreements at this moment uh, do not provide the scope for countries to regulate the inflow and outflow of capital. Looking at this slide, let's start on the left with the WTO and GATS. In the WTO and GATS in general, um, there are a lot of avenues to safeguard the regulation of cross-border financial flows for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, in the WTO, uh, it only covers financial services, not, not all forms of cross-border transfers and investment. Uh, when a country is negotiating under the GATS, um, it has a positive list approach, and it only liberalizes those sectors that the country sees as, as particularly ready 
So if a country has liberalized the financial services sector, then all of the financial flows in between those financial services sectors uh, have to be liberalized too. Um, and any regulation would be seen in violation of that. However, a country doesn't list financial services or doesn't list uh, cross-border financial transactions, then they would be uh, exempt from any restrictions on the ability to regulate financial flows. Now, even if a country did uh, list cross-border financial flows, they could put limitations on that. The country of Chile has put limitations on its schedule so that it can regulate in an emergency with a piece of legislation that they have on their books. Even without those limitations built into your schedule, however, you, they're both, uh, there are two safeguards within the WTO. One is for balance of payments and the other one is called the prudential safeguard that may allow countries some flexibility to regulate the inflow and outflow of capital. And finally, the dispute resolution system under the WTO uh, is state to state. What do I mean by that? It brings regulators and state nation states to look at the case. Um, and so they're going to be more apt to be able to examine the extent to which a regulation is a bona fide one or not. This approach, the WTO GATS approach, really stands in stark contrast with uh, many free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties that are proliferating across the world, especially those of the United States, uh, United States. I have the privilege of serving on the United States Department of State's uh, Investment Rules Subcommittee of its Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy, very long name, which basically says we're the folks who provide advice to the United States government on, uh, on its model bilateral investment treaty. Um, and so I've had an opportunity to look at this very closely and share some of these concerns, both with the United States government officially through this uh, body, but also as a, a private advisor to a number of government officials at the executive branch and also uh, a great number of congressional people. So the Free trade agreements and bilateral investment treaties have a much broader scope of coverage. The definition of investment is very broad, but and also very specific. It covers all kinds of investments, sovereign lending, uh, all bonds, derivatives, and so forth. Second of all, it's a negative list. So everything is liberalized 100% unless it's listed uh, on a, in a negative list type manner. Um, in the United States, there is not a, a balance of payments exception. However, there was in, in under NAFTA, but there hasn't been one since NAFTA in 1994. And the prudential exception, although it borrows a bit from the World Trade Organization, it puts a set of uh, specific restrictions that make it more difficult for countries to regulate capital flows. And the key other crutch is that uh, these provisions under bilateral investment treaties and investment provisions and trade agreements uh, are governed by investor state dispute settlement. Uh, this allows the private firm, the hedge fund, or the financial management company to directly file a case against a country putting in place a regulation. And so it pulls the regulators uh, uh, at le it, uh, out of the picture um, and it makes it more difficult for the regulators on both sides of the transaction to weigh the larger costs and benefits of the entire uh, transaction. Let's look at these in, in, uh, in some more detail and, and to say how important it is to be thinking about this because the United States is currently involved in trade and investment treaties with about 80% of the world economy. Uh, this slide shows the Trans-Pacific Partnership um, and bilateral investment treaties between the United States and China and the United States and India. These co cover about 56% of the world economy. Then we're also in negotiating something called uh, the TTIP between the United States and Europe, which covers another significant part of the world economy, all adding up to about 80% of the world economy. And of course, there, in the background, there are still WTO negotiations. So under the WTO, uh, Article 16, footnote 8 of the GATS um, says specifically that if a country lists uh, cross-border financial flows, uh, 
and financial services in its schedule for the GATS, then it must allow the free movement of capital inside and outside of the country. And that any regulation for that is a violation of their commitment. Uh, however, the GATS Article 12 has a restriction on the balance of payments, um, which is a balance of payments exception, which says, heck, if there's a serious balance of payments and external financial difficulties or the threat thereof, a member can adopt or maintain restrictions on trade and services on which it has undertaken specific uh, commitments. So the uh, capital controls on outflows of capital that Iceland undertook in the event of the crisis of 2007-2009 uh, fit in under the balance of payments exception. There's also an annex on financial services under the GATT, Article 2A, which is referred to as the prudential safeguard. And it says that notwithstanding any other provisions of the agreement, a member should not be prevented from taking measures for prudential reasons, including for the protection of investors, depositors, policyholders, or persons to whom a fiduciary duty is owed a financial service supplier, or to ensure the integrity and stability of the financial system. Where such measures do not conform with the provision of this agreement, they shall not be used as a means of avoiding the member's commitments or obligations under the agreement. There's been a lot of discussion about this, um, about this safeguard, and there are two ways of thinking about it. One, it should, it's, it should be important to say that thus far, there has not been a case at the WTO on regulations on inflows of capital. But those lawyers who have analyzed it are very concerned about two points. One, the first thing that I have highlighted and read there, what is the definition of prudential? Prudential in most legal texts and case law refers to the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions, not necessarily the financial health of the entire economy. Since the financial crisis, we've been referring to something referred to more as macro prudential, which does think about the safety and soundness of the entire system. The other sentence of concern is the last sentence there, where such measures do not conform with the provisions of the agreement, they shall not be used as a means of avoiding the member's commitments or obligations under the agreement. Some folks see this as really self-canceling and not really giving countries the flexibility they need. The uh, legal scholarship on this uh, holds the safeguard up with some real concern. However, there has been a, um, a set of workshops at the WTO, and there has been a bit of a quiet acknowledgement that uh, at least after this crisis, if, if someone tries to use this, they're likely to be able to get the measures through. And the problem is on the, in the United States case, is that uh, the US has, has not had the kind of process they've had at the WTO, um, and they've gone out of their way to define prudential reasons uh, as something that is only deals with the safety and soundness of individual financial institutions. So being clear that uh, these kinds of measures do not pertain to the regulation of inflow to try to deal with the financial stability of the entire country, and the US also has that controversial second paragraph that could be, second sentence that, uh, last sentence that could be um, self-canceling. These measures are widely seen as, uh, as being limiting on the ability of nations to be able to regulate and the ability of the International Monetary Fund to give sound advice to countries. There's been a number of ideas for reform that different countries are taking part in. Uh, Brazil and South Africa are refraining from taking on new commitments and regimes incompatible, incompatible with the ability to regulate. Ecuador is trying to put in place interpretations of existing treaty language. They actually spearheaded the effort at the WTO to try to interpret that prudential exception to examine the extent to which some of the measures it took in 2008 gave it the room to move. The European Union, to some extent, is amending existing treaties to reconcile current things incompatibilities and build in safeguards specifically for this. Um, and as these new treaties come, come, in, come online, there's a big effort to design better safeguards for these new treaties. Um, the United States in its agreement with Chile in 2003 took one step towards that. Chile has a 
fairly well-regarded regulation on the inflow of capital, one of the last sticking points on this treaty was the fact that the prudential exception would not uh, allow them to use that regulation. After uh, much discussion, the United States granted uh, the Chileans what is called a cooling off annex or special dispute settlement provision, which says that Chile can go ahead and use those regulations. Those regulations are still in violation of the treaty and a country and a private firm under ISDS can still file a claim for a regulation that is used, but they're not allowed to file the claim until a certain amount of time uh, after the measure was put in so that the regulators can deal with the financial problem at home, uh, but then pay the consequences if they lose the case in the future. Chile was not happy with that, uh, that many economists are not happy with that. Uh, many regulators see that as still uh, A, a chilling effect on, on the regulations and B, still having to pay an inappropriate cost for regulating in a way that prevents financial instability. Uh, Chile was able to get you know, what's called a controlled entry clause, which is a clause to the treaty that allows the country at its own discretion to use the regulation when it sees fit uh, under its treaty with Canada and its treaty with the European Union. Um, in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, Chile has been trying to get those gains that they had in other agreements put back in the TPP in a way that would hopefully uh, hopefully rectify the problem in the 2003 U.S.-Chile bit. I won't read all of this to you, but this is text from a leaked text that happened earlier this year in 2015 on the TPP that has Chile's proposal. There's also a proposal by Malaysia under the TPP to include a balance of pay payment safeguard. As I told you before, the uh, no U.S. treaty has had a balance of payment safeguard since the 1994 North American Free Trade Agreement. So Malaysia, who, uh, whereas Chile has been really racked by surges of inflows, Malaysia uh, in 1998 was really hurt from a sudden stop and massive capital outflows in 1998. And they put on place regulations on those outflows that have largely been seen as successful to mitigate the impact of that crisis. And they want to make sure that they have the window to be able to do that. They proposed a balance of payment safeguard uh, in uh, all throughout the regulations. An interesting new development is that the United States and, and Canada um, have acknowledged the weaknesses in the current text. And they're right now the balance of payment safeguard and the prudential exception is uh, very much in play. The United States has come back with a uh, counter proposal that takes many of the Malaysian recommendations but tempers them a little bit. Um, it tries to create an exemption for equities or stocks. Uh, and it also tries to put a strict limit on the amount of time that a regulation uh, can be in place. The U.S. counterproposals are a step in the right direction, but as we know, if you if there's a problem in the inflows in the bond market, but uh, and you regulate those, if you create a window where you can where you're not allowed to regulate equities, well then that creates a loophole for a surge in equities. That's what we saw in Brazil uh, in 2013. Also, time limits are hard to hard to get. Sometimes you only need to have regulation in place for a couple months. Sometimes you need it for a couple years. Uh, the Brazilians had theirs in place for a couple years. South Korea had theirs in place for a couple years. These are both regulations on inflows. And the IMF uh, recommended that Iceland have its regulations in place for over two years uh, on the outflow of capital. So it's an important step in the right direction that the United States is acknowledging the weaknesses in their past treaties and trying to uh, come closer to what their emerging markets have been telling them that they should do. Um, but uh, these two loopholes are things that in the final months of the TPP uh, will hopefully be closed. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk to you about all this stuff. Uh, I go into much more detail about it in a 2015 book that I wrote.
called Ruling Capital, Emerging Markets, and the Re-Regulation of Cross-Border Finance. Thanks a lot.